Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. As always, I'm Billy. I got my man Dame here with me. And we were getting history either way. Either way, we were getting history. The eight seed was going to make the finals for the second time ever, or we were going to see the first team to come back from a 3 0 series deficit. And it looked like the clock was going to strike midnight for Miami after game six. And the clock got about to 11.58. <laughs> batteries must have ran out or something. They, Cinderella run is continuing all the way into the NBA finals. I can't say it enough. They were down three with three minutes to go in the second play-in game. And they are in the NBA finals. Um, dominating performance from them in game seven. And we're going to. We're going to get all into that because uh, some people got to get exposed today. 100%. 1,000%. So, yeah. So before we get into that, we're going to get the housekeeping out the way. As always, if you are on YouTube, be sure to like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Um, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, go ahead and drop a five-star review on the pod. Helps us out a ton. Helps the pod out a ton. Um, subscribe to us on our, our social platforms, the TikTok and Instagram, both off the glass pod. Um, yeah, we're posting shorts content up there daily. Um, we appreciate all the support that y'all have shown so far. So, you know, please be sure to like, comment, share everything, all the socials. We appreciate it. Um, but without further ado, we're going to get right into it. Like I said, um, after what was one of the craziest buzzer beaters I think we've ever seen in playoff history I don't think that's an overstatement um I was at a bar and they did not have the audio on so we were all just standing there like this with our hands <laughs> over our head trying to figure out if that shot really counted until we just were waiting to see the Celtics players reactions and then they finally put the final score up and Derek White saved the day and if you asked me before game seven to me that would have felt like they're going to be the first team to come back from 03 and get to play game seven at home after such a, I imagine it has to be a deflating loss for Miami, right? Like mm -hmm. so many things go wrong for the Celtics there at the end. A um, couple of really bad fouls from Al Horford that send Jimmy to the free throw line that give them the lead. And I mean, you get the, the stop technically right. Bad shot by Marcus Smart, tough shot. Nobody boxes out Derek White. And they forced the game seven. And for a multitude of reasons um, that we'll, we'll get into all of them here, but the Heat ran away with it in Boston on the parquet floor and took their third game on the road in this series and are heading to take on the Nuggets in the finals. Only the Celtics could lose three games out of four on yeah. their home court, man. Like that's that is crazy. Um, yeah, man. The the Heat just don't quit. The Heat nope. just do not go away. If you told me, it, honestly, any other team in the league lose that game six like that in that fashion on your home court, th they're done. Like they're emotionally checked out. They're just done. But honestly. Um, when you've seen like the post game press conferences after the game with Spo and Jimmy Butler, like they they seem like they were well, Spo seemed like he was amped up. Like he, you saw him, he was like banging on the on the desk, like I want to play right now, like I want to play the game seven right now. So he was locked in. You know, Jimmy, mm -hmm. I feel like Jimmy is one of the best leaders um, that we have in this league because he seems like he's never phased. He seems like he always gets his guys going. He always instills confidence in those guys. So I mean, if any team was gonna come back from that devastating loss in Game Six. It would be the Miami Heat. So um, in that aspect, I'm not too surprised that they didn't quit. Now, on the other hand, I didn't expect them to, to blow out the Celtics. I, I didn't expect that. I mean, I just felt like all that momentum, you right. know, Derek White basically saved your season with that with that tip in. Mm -hmm. You play game seven. You can make history on your home court. It's like I thought that they were going to come out and, and it just it just give a good effort. And it just seemed like. I don't know. They just they just had a no show, you know. Like we, we're gonna talk about, there's a lot of factors that went into it, but at the end of the day, Miami Heat just they seem like they just wanted it way more than the Celtics, which is weird because it's like, it's like, like we saw the stake game seven to go to the finals on your home court. Like, come on, man, you can't ask for a a better ending 
to to what what would have been a historic run. Right. Yeah. And exactly. And they would have had back to back finals appearances. The second year in a row, they they could have taken the Heat out. And the one of the biggest reasons, and I know I I've, I've mentioned it before, right? I'm not a huge fan of high volume three point shooting offenses because you run into this exact scenario where it's great when they fall. And if it doesn't, your offense looks real bad and there's not a Mm -hmm. lot of other ways to turn to looking like the 20, what was it? 18 rockets, right? (laughs) Over Mm -hmm. 27. Missed 27 straight. Right. They, uh, the Celtics come out and do not make a three pointer until the second quarter started the game. 0 for 12 from three, not terrible looks. Right. But, after that many don't fall, you cannot just sit and continue to shoot them in a one-game scenario. If it's a regular mm-hmm. season game, it's not an elimination game, maybe a little different, but this is it, right? It's win or go home. You don't have the luxury of just hoping that the shots are going to fall at some point because there is no other, there's no next game. So at some point, you have got to get downhill and try to get to the basket. The fact that you start the game 0 for 12 in the first quarter and still end the game with more three-pointer shot than two-pointers is unacceptable. It's not, it's not acceptable. You shot 82 shots and 42 <clears throat> of them were three-pointers, and you made nine. They can't play another way. That's, that's the problem. They can't – like – it's easy to say, yeah, just stop shooting threes. But when that's how you got to this point, that's when that's how you got the second overall seed. That's how you got to the Eastern Conference Finals. It's like they can't win another way. It seems like, like when they're like you said, when their threes aren't falling, like they live and die by the three. Mm-hmm. They died in Game Seven. When you when you only win by shooting threes and playing defense, it's like when the threes aren't falling, it's tough. Like, they yeah. have no other way to score. What makes it more frustrating is. You have two of the most dynamic wings in all of basketball who can both create their own shot at a very elite level from all three levels of the court. And in this game, it feels like the only person who really made a concerted effort at times to even get into the paint was Derek White. Mm Mm-hmm. He had a couple of and ones there. He drew a good amount of fouls. He shot the most free throws in the game for Boston. Um, He was like the only guy that was like, look, if the shots aren't falling, I'm going to get downhill. Why can we not see that from Tatum or Brown or literally anybody else um, on a night where the shots aren't falling like that? So that, that was frustrating to watch just as a fan, because I, like I said, I not a, the biggest fan of of that type of basketball. And I think that, again, it runs you into these situations and it it, it bit them at the worst time possible. And they live by the three and they definitely died by the three last night. Um, So you also got to tip your cap to Miami 50% from three when they, when the shot is falling like that for them, especially from deep, um, they're going to be a tough team to beat just with all the defensive pressure that they present on the other side of the ball. So um Credit to Caleb Martin, who arguably could have been the MVP of this series. uh, Should have been the MVP. I don't care. (laughs) Listen, I don't care what nobody say. Caleb Martin should have won the Eastern Conference MVP. I I don't care. I understand Jimmy Butler is the best player. I understand he had some good games in the series. Like game one, he had, I think, 35 points. Game Mm -hmm. two, he had 27 he was he was doing he was playing obviously playing great defense, rebounding, assisting. So Jimmy Butler obviously he had his great games, but the the my thing is Caleb Martin was the most consistent player on the Heat throughout this entire series. Yeah. Even in the games that they were losing, Caleb Martin was the reason why they were even still in some of those games. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Even his last game, game seven. Yeah, Jimmy Butler ended up with more points. I think he ended with twenty eight, but Caleb Martin, every bucket I feel like he got just seemed like it was so much more impactful. Like it, this guy was just consistent. He was hitting shots. He was rebounding. One of the games, I think, I believe he had like 15 rebounds. He was rebounding, playing great defense. In my opinion, I feel like Caleb Martin should have won that award. But I get it. The way awards is now, it's just whoever's the most popular guy, we're just going to give it to him. You know what I mean? <laughs> 
Jimmy, Jimmy definitely had better counting stats, and a lot of that is, is carried by those first two games, 35 in game one, 27 in game two. So he finishes with just under 25 points a game in this series, um, almost eight rebounds and six assists. Another huge thing, he, he's finished with two and a half steals a game. Because um, mm-hmm. especially, again, a lot of that driven by that six-steal game in game one. Um, but Caleb Martin, I think easily, if, you're, if he's not the MVP, easily the second-best player. Um, for this Heat team this series, averaged almost 20 points a game in this series on 60% from the field, 49% from three, and 87.5 from the free throw line. He was almost 60, 50, <laughs> He's going to get a bag this offseason. Somebody, you know, some bad team is going to overpay <laughs> overpay like crazy for Caleb Martin this offseason. Yeah. Do you know that his brother is on a bigger contract than him right now? You're lying. No yep. shot. Found that out this morning. I didn't know that. Wow. That's Cody crazy. Martin. Cody Martin. Has a larger cap hit than Caleb Martin, who <laughs> was almost the, the Eastern Conference Finals MVP. <laughs> Man, I mean, good for him though. You know what I'm saying? Good for he's he's gonna get a bag this offseason, and, and rightfully so. You know, yeah. those role players who can step up in these big moments who seem like they're not afraid of the moment, um, that can knock down shots, play good defense, seem like they can just kind of do it all. Like like I said, he had 15 rebounds in one of the games, so yeah. he he definitely is gonna deserve to get paid good money this offseason. Yeah, hundred percent. Jumping your your uh, regular season point per game from 9.6 to almost 19.6 in this series alone on the biggest stage going up against a team that I still think on paper would be consensus more talented, but there's so many other factors that come into play, right? Mm -hmm. He, he stepped up in a major way for this team. Um, Some of the other things that I I saw last night that, that really hurt the Celtics. um, They came out again early in drop coverage. Um, a lot of their high pick and roll actions, they had Al Horford sitting in that drop. Um, and that dug them into the early hole that they were in in the first half, coupled with the bad shooting. Um, on the other side of the ball, Miami is making them pay um, when Al is sinking off of these screens and they're knocking down some of their three-pointers. So um, that's – it can't happen. Um, we we got to be quicker on the, the adjustment there if you're, you're Joe Missoula to – to deny that easy access three uh, and, and have how have Al step up, show more, hedge more, whatever it is. But um, those early drops dug them into a big hole. Um, additionally, um, the Heat won the Jimmy Butler on the bench minutes in the first half, which was also mm-hmm. huge. He sat for just over four minutes um in the the first half and the heat were a plus eight with him off the court in a game seven huge right Mm -hmm. again all the credit in the world to spo and this miami heat team and all the role players who continue to step up because that's a credit to them their defense as i've said all all postseason has been phenomenal um even watching right like the typical thing against the zone is you beat it with ball movement you beat it with shooting which boston is perfectly equipped to do but just just watching the rotations it's everybody is on a string everybody is moving for one another Mm -hmm. um, and they're able to get decent contests on a lot of what would otherwise be open looks um probably against any other team so Again, that's complete credit to to the coaching staff and, and the role players for stepping up there. So, yeah, I think some, some bad coverage there by by Boston, and then additionally, winning those Jimmy Butler bench minutes are is, is huge for them in the first half. And then, um, in, the, in the third quarter, in the second half, it, it really got away for them. And um, surprised we even got this far without mentioning it. Um, obviously, the first play of the game, Jason Tatum rolling his ankle. I think clearly had a a huge impact and shift on how this game went. Mm -hmm. Um, Visibly was in pain the entire game. Um, Every time he, he, you know, looked to push the ball, anytime he jumped, landed, even going back on defense, you can just see they're zooming in on his face. He's got a a grimace. He's in in clear pain and discomfort with that ankle. So 
Um, you never want to see a guy not be 100 percent in this this kind of situation. So, you know, him finishing up with, with 14 points, five of 13 from the field is tough. You know, you wish he was healthy, and you wish that he um, didn't wasn't dealing with the ankle injury. But the person that I want to spend the most time on, and you have, I was going to backtrack. Yeah, two, <laughs> two all NBA players right on your roster, right? Mm-hmm. First play of the game, your your first team all NBA, fourth and MVP voting player rolls his ankle, mm-hmm. sets the stage for Jalen Brown to take this game over. Apparently, he's better than Tatum. That's what everyone's been telling me. So that's what people have been telling me. So this, I don't know what people were watching, bro. <laughs> Oh um, man, that is crazy. But yeah, sets the stage for him to have a signature performance <clears throat> at home mm-hmm. and put the team on his back and get them to their second straight NBA finals. He finishes the game eight for 23 from the field, one for nine from three, and had eight turnovers. Eight of their 15 turnovers. Him and Tatum combined for 10. I even want to to throw Tatum into it because right. Howard also had three. Realistically, Jalen Brown had over half of the Celtics turnovers last night. He was terrible. And unfortunately for him, this is kind of how the whole series went. I believe in this whole series, he probably had two decent games. And even one of those games, I think it was game six, he still was 0 for 4 from three. So... Like you said, he, he's, he's had, he has 19 points for this series and is shooting 16% from three. That is abysmal from your second team all NBA guy. And like you said, when your main guy is clearly how clearly be himself in this game. I'm not giving him a lot of a lot of heat for this game. You know, he's visibly hurt, can't do the same thing that he normally does. Cool. That is the whole reason why you would have your soon-to-be super max player Mm -hmm. on this roster to be able to step up, fill in that role, and contribute and help your team to get this win. But That's what dynamic duos do. Exactly. When your guy doesn't have it or he's hobbled, he's injured, that's your time. That is your job to step up. And especially knowing that you want to get paid, there are some questions about, like, should the Celtics pay Jalen Brown all this money? It's like, if he every comes year, out, if, every year he's in trade rumors. You're mad that you're in trade rumors. You're mad that they're constantly trying to ship you out for a KD or whoever. And you're like, this is what this was your time. You know what I mean? If you come out here and you have, even if you lose, even if you guys lose, if you come out here and you have a 30 point game, uh, it's down to the wire. You guys lose a close one. It's like, okay, we see why we want to keep this duel together. Tatum doesn't have it. Jalen Brown steps up and. I, and I don't think, like, Jalen Brown, I've seen a lot of overreactions. Like, oh, my God, Jalen Brown stinks. He sucks. Trade him yeah. away. Like, he doesn't suck. You know what I mean? Like, just last year, we were talking about how Jalen Brown was the guy that stepped up in that finals when Tatum right. didn't have it. So, I just think it was a bad series for him. It happened. You know what I mean? So, I don't think he's a bad player by any means. But it, it's definitely it's definitely bad that it happened at this time in this series going into this off season. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. When you're trying to get paid, it's like, you just made second team all NBA. It, it's a bad look for sure. It, it's a real bad look. Yeah. Soon to be, I think his contract would be upwards of 240 or 250 million dollars. I thought um, it was two, I thought it was 295. Five years, 295. That's what he's eligible for. I know Jason Tatum is over like 315. That number yeah. alone is like, I can't even. That's a ridiculous number. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. Like you said, would you say 16% from three in this series? I'll tell you right now, he is 19 points per game. Yep. He has six rebounds, three assists, cool. Um, so yeah, 40% from the field, 16% from three. Can't a negative happen. five uh, in the plus minus throughout the whole series. Yeah. Average 3.6 turnovers a game. Like you said, and ended the series with an eight turnover game. That it can't happen. It just yeah. cannot happen. Um, there's going to be, as there is every offseason, right? Ton of trade rumors. Ton of people that want to break up 
the Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown duo. I need more time to think on it. I've always been a big guy on that's never going to be the answer here. Like, this is the first season where it's like you have – they're both all NBA. They're both all stars. Like They're both hitting their primes together. You, It almost feels foolish to want to break that up. Mm-hmm. I think there's other holes in this roster that – they can address that can help them two of them being one they don't have a offensive focused big so the fact that bam got into foul trouble and spo said i'm gonna put hayward highsmith in at the five we're gonna go super small and al horford is rolling to the basket and cashing and passing back to the three-point line which again Mm -hmm goes back to your philosophy. You're always looking for driving exactly. kicks and exactly right. He's got a he, he's got a shorter guy on him. At some point, you gotta roll hard and you've got to look to punish that on the inside. It's a system problem. Right. It's that, just it's the way they play. That's the problem. It, but some of it is personnel too, because that's never been Al Horford's game. And, and Rob Will is more of a, a lob threat on that mm-hmm. on the offensive side of the ball for them. So they don't have a, a huge offensive big. You're not saying they need to go out and get, you know, the number one option, but somebody that can punish on the interior, I think, is needed for this roster. In addition to, I think, a true point guard, somebody to really run their offense. Um, and that then will let Marcus Smart kind of, go back to the role he used to play, kind of playing the two and being that off off ball guard, combo guard, and let him just kind of be the playmaker that he can be on both sides of the court, making impact plays on the defensive side of the ball, can spot up and have big shots for you, um, you know, still make all the hustle plays, all the things that make Marcus Smart great. They've been trying to find a point guard for, I don't know how, like Brogdon was supposed to be the answer, which he was – he played well this season. Um, I think yeah. he, didn't he wasn't he like injured during this playoffs though? Like he was playing with uh, I forgot what his injury was. So it kind yeah, of yeah. Up. He only played. I don't think he played in game six, right? And then uh, this game, he barely played minutes. in this game. Yeah. yeah. So um, they've been they've been trying to find a point guard for forever. Like it seems like they could just never find that guy that can help them run their offense. Which, like you said, I feel like would help them tremendously. Um, and yeah, yeah, it's. Their uh, offense, so just, we've talked about it multiple times this postseason. Their, their offense has those moments where it just looks stale, right? It, <clears throat> it's the same drive and kick. It's the same swing, swing, swing pass that they're not – there's no motion, really. Like, mm-hmm. there's ball motion, but there's no player motion on the court. Right, no player movement. Right. I, mean, I, I think a lot – I think some of that, too. Um, I think the Tatum injury also – was a bigger reason as far as their whole offense going stale. Mm-hmm. But a lot of times it feels like Tatum, like when Tatum has it going, he has the ball in his hands a lot. He's running that pick and roll. He's creating for others, whether yeah. it's driving kicks, whether it's, you know, giving it inside the back, inside the paint to make play for others. So um, I feel like the Tatum injury was – obviously it's huge, but as far as the rest of the team, like in the other games that they won, it seemed like they really fed off of his early offense, whether it was initiating for others or it was himself scoring. And the the whole rest of the team seemed like they fed off of that. So when you eliminate him being able to score early, or at least just be as aggressive as he normally is, I think that had a had an effect on the others on the team. Hundred um, percent. I went and found a lot of statistics from this series and Game Seven, particularly that I think will help to put a lot into context and kind of summarize the issues that the Celtics had and, and some of the heat role players stepping up. And it just, it just, again, I just want to share a lot of these because they blew my mind to see some of them. First one, Jalen Brown in the regular season had 232 assists and 197 turnovers. In the postseason, he had 63 assists and 58 turnovers. Almost a one to eight turnovers. Almost a one to one assist to turnover ratio in the postseason. Yo, yo, he need listen. What he needs to do in the offseason, he don't do need to do nothing else but work on his handle. 
this guy, I bro, I've never seen it so bad from from this caliber of player and someone who is so I'm not gonna say ball dominant, but the way he scores is ISO go one on one, and for someone that that's your game to have such a bad handle is like ridiculous to me, and it's like it's been like that since last all last postseason. Mm-hmm. That was their big problem. That was the postseason that Tatum had like a hundred turnovers or something crazy like that. Him and Brown were just drive to the basket, lose the ball. Crossover, lose the ball. Like, please go work your hands with JB. Please. I, I'm tired of seeing you drive to the basket and just lose it. Like, you don't know how to go left. I'm I'm so glad you brought that up because the clip is coming back around last year. J, uh, Draymond Green went on JJ Wright's podcast after the finals. And JJ asked him, you know, what changed on the back half of that series game four, five, and six that, you know, y'all kind of were able to hone in and figure out and and turn that series around and close it out in six. And he very specifically said, he said, well, you know, those guys turn the ball over a lot and it seemed to get worse when you make them go left. And someone went and rewatched all of Jalen Brown's turnovers last night. Four of them were rips, right? Somebody on the heat poking it away. Mm -hmm. All four of them, he's driving to his left. Bro, he has no left hand, bro. Jalen Brown has no left hand. And it's crazy that you're, like we said, about to be a super max player, second team all NBA, and all somebody has to do is force you to your offhand and you just lose the ball. That can't happen, bro. I'm sorry. That cannot happen for my second best player. And I've said it before. When you get to the playoffs, you're never going to – your go-to move, your next go-to – it's never going to be there. That's what Mm -hmm. good teams, good coaching is going to take away. Exactly. So if they know if I can force this guy left, he's <laughs> gonna turn the ball over. He's not gonna get good quality looks. That's what's gonna happen. And they are just giving him the left side of the lane to go. And that guy's coming out the corner and he's poking. There's a couple where they might have been Jimmy is reaching behind and ripping around, it away. Right. right. Like he's gotta work on it. <laughs> he's gotta work on it. You cannot be a super max player. And for two postseasons in a row now. It's clear and evident that teams are able to exploit your inability to drive to the left. It's hindering your team. That's uh, crazy. Another, another crazy one here. In this series, Caleb Martin shot 82 shots, scored 123 points. Jalen Brown shot 124 shots and had 127 points. 40, uh, 42 more shots and scored four more points than the lesser paid Martin Brown. And one of those guys is about to make 300 mil. So, man, it's going to be a – ooh, it's going to be a rough offseason for Boston, man. They got some decisions to make in Boston. Yeah. Um, man. I – there's so many things that watching this game, it just I, I can't say some of them enough. I, I there was points in the game where I feel like Duncan Robinson had more points in the paint than Jalen Brown. How does that happen? Duncan Robinson mm. just low key was taking people off the dribble in this a series. A lot, a lot, like way more than I've ever seen him do ever, bro. I knew this game was 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 over when Duncan Robinson hit a three and he hit the (laughs) I can't hear you to the garden crowd when you got Duncan Robinson doing that pack it up bro right and that's not even that's no shade to him but it's if we're being honest the role players are taunting the home crowd in Boston in game seven you know you know it's kind of crazy though I don't know what it is about Boston but this is not a home court advantage. Like, it's a hostile place to play. It is. But it's like, you can go in there and you can win. Steph did it. LeBron with the Cavs did it. That Knicks team did it years ago. Like, you can go into the garden and win. Like, it's not a place that is just, you know, the Heat did it, obviously. It's like, it's not a place that, like, we, like, certain places, like, all right, we don't, we don't want to go to Oracle when it was Oracle. You, we don't want right. to go there. Staples, when it was the old Staples Center, it was a tough place to play. Like, it's a certain place that you go into, and it's like, if we're going to win this one, like, we got to win this one. This is going to be a rough one. 
Right. Boston, like, we good. Like, we're, we're fine going back to Boston. Like, we know we can win in there. It's no problem. Here's another one. We're flowing good today, right? Another great <laughs> stat. Back-to-back years now, the Celtics have lost six games at home in the postseason. First, that's the most in any two-game, two-year span, I think, in their organizational history. Mm-hmm. So to your point, right, I don't know what the heck it is, but they genuinely do not – does not feel like they have home court advantage at nah. arguably the most iconic arena in basketball. One yeah. of them at least, right? The mm-hmm. parquet floor has been the parquet floor since – the seventies, right? I might be further back than that. It says Kuzi and you know all those guys played. Bill Russell, like all the legends that have played in the Boston Garden, now the TD Garden, one of the most iconic arenas in all of sports. And it's been even they've lost more games at home than they won this postseason. <laughs> Man, that's. I don't know. It's not a home court advantage for them. I don't know. I and I genuinely don't know why that is. Like I can't. There's no. I can't be like, oh yeah, Joe Mazzulla just can't get these guys going at home. It's like they've done that. Like you said, they've done that with email. Like I don't have the answer. I don't know if anyone has the answer as to why these guys can't play the same way they do at home that they do on the road. It genuinely makes no sense to me. Yeah, but I. It, it's. I think maybe baffling. maybe maybe this the arena doesn't have that same yeah, like. Because we brought up the historical, like, the fact that this this stadium obviously has a lot of historical, like, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, it's a very historical arena, basically. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, we talked about the Larry Birds, the Russell, and all that. That doesn't seem to have any sort of impact on the, guy, on the way these guys play. Like, that means nothing to this new age Boston team. It is not those old teams. It does not have that same lore, I guess, uh, what I'm looking for. Like, it, it means nothing to them. Yeah. The last set I have that is really, you know, anti-Boston. Um, I shouldn't say anti, but just exposing them. Um, and then we can we can give the Heat their flowers after this because that's also well-deserved. Um, just looking at this team on paper, two All-NBA players, one first team, one second team. Your best player finishes fourth. And MVP voting. You have last year's defensive player of the year. You have this year's six man of the year. Granted, was hurt in these last two games, but was played a large portion of the series. And an all defensive team player in Derek White. And you lose to the AT. <laughs> With seven undrafted players, by the way. Right. And. <laughs> Even take the undrafted thing away, like missing serious. missing a twenty point per game score and Victor Oladipo. Caleb Martin, oh my gosh, Caleb Martin and Tyler Hero um, combined to make twenty two threes in this series, and Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown combined for eighteen. You know, and it, it's crazy because. Wait, 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 wait. Did you hear what I just said? Caleb yeah, it's, Martin it's, and Tyler Hero, who hasn't <laughs> played since the first round of the playoffs, <laughs> combined for more threes than two all NBA players on the Boston Celtics. That are combined to possibly make almost six hundred half a dollars. billion dollars in payroll. <laughs> oh man, that is crazy. And it's like, if you're a Celtics fan, you can't even say, like, oh, but if Tatum wasn't hurt, maybe we win, maybe whatever, whatever. I don't think, like, why is this even a game seven? Why did you go down 0-3 in the first place? Like, right. why did you give yourself no room for error? Like, yes, it's unfortunate that he got hurt. Yes, like, things happen. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's why no team has ever come back from 0-3 because, like, it is hard to beat a team. Four straight times. I don't care what team it is. It's hard to beat them four straight times. But the fa- you can't even look at this game like, oh, if we get a couple more, if Tatum doesn't get hurt, you know what I mean? If we get the threes to fall, it's like 
you gave yourself no room for error by going down 0-3. Exactly. Why did you even allow yourself to do that in the first place? Like, How did you drop the first two games at home? How do you go to Miami in a must-win game and get the brakes beat off you? Exactly. Those are all bigger problems to me than this Game 7 performance. 100%. Because that's a, right, that's a bigger sample size. Mm-hmm. Right? You go into the series 0-0, zero, zero, and you leave your home court down 0-2. That cannot happen. You know no team has ever come back from an 0-3 deficit. So to not only go down 0-3, but to go down 0-3 in the way that they did, looking mm-hmm. absolutely embarrassing for the entirety of the game, start to finish, just get thoroughly outplayed both sides of the ball, not even a game. Great. They fought back. They needed – one of, again, the greatest buzzer beaters we probably have ever seen in postseason history in game six to even get to this point. The shots don't fall for you in game seven. Your stars don't come to play in game seven. One of your stars gets hurt in game seven. Um, but Caleb Martin outplayed both the Jays <laughs> on the Celtics. Yeah. Um, yeah, that look, that – we can ease up on the Celtics for a little bit because we've given them enough heat. Um, Man. I want to give as more than we already have Caleb Martin's <clears throat> flowers. Um, we already listed his, his splits for this, this series. Um, he scored 120, 132 points in the conference finals. Um, actually, that is one, 135, 135 points. Um, in the conference finals. So that is the most uh, most points in a conference finals by an undrafted player um, in the modern era. So since 1966 to now, um, pass up John Starks, who did it in 1994. So again, we, him, yeah, we said it a ton. He's going to get himself a, a bag this off season and rightfully so stepped up. I think I said it earlier um, in one of our earlier episodes, he just is playing his role perfectly. You cannot ask anything more of what's required of him to be open, to find space, to knock down shots, to know when to drive on a closeout. Um, and then he's going above and beyond. He's crashing the glass. He's providing energy plays. He's active on defense. Uh, he's doing so much for this Heat team right now. Um, and – and like I said, I think he's the second best player in the series, which I'm going to get on Bam in a little bit. But he's <laughs> the second best player in this series uh, for the Heat. And it is, it is a, they would not be in the NBA Finals without Caleb Martin, which is not something I had on my 2023 bingo card. But <laughs> here we are. This playoffs has been about as unpredictable as anyone I can remember in, in recent memory. Look, like I said, I feel like he should have won the Eastern Conference MVP. Like, and it's funny because as soon as the game ended, I was like, let me keep watching because I want to see them rob him because I know they were going to give it to Jimmy Butler. <laughs> like, I know they were going to give it to Jimmy Butler. Like, it's just whoever the best player is, you're going to give it to him. And, like, there's no disrespect to Jimmy Butler. He still had a good series. You know, he had his great games. Obviously, he is their best player. But like you said, they do not win this series. They don't even get here without Caleb Martin. He was huge. He was – I could you I could easily say he was the most consistent guy for the Heat in this whole series. Whether Jimmy Butler had some better games than him or not, he was the most consistent. Because even yeah. in their losses, you've seen Caleb Martin out there. He's hooping. He's mm-hmm. out there scoring. He's rebounding. He's doing everything. I'd say he played his role, his role, but he played it even better. There was times where they needed a bucket. Like even I think was it was to end one of the quarters. This guy gets the inbound, comes up the court. He's like, nah, give me the ball. Comes up the court, drive past Tatum, shoots a little fadeaway turnaround jump shot. So. He's been playing really well. Like we talked about, he's going to get a bag this all season, rightfully so. But he he's one of those guys that you need. You know what I mean? He He's one of those guys that a championship-level team needs. Uh, role players who are not afraid of the moment, who are not afraid to step up, do it, what is needed from them, and then even sometimes can go a little bit above and beyond that. So he, he he's a great role player. For sure. And to go to some of the other key players on the heat here, Kyle Lawyer was a plus 26 last night for Miami. Um, mm-hmm. his role coming off the bench and leading that second unit. Um, all credit to him. 
he he's kind of I think flipped the narrative um, for especially his Heat tenure. There's a lot of question marks about him, um, especially this season and, and leading into this postseason with some inconsistent play and just not really living up to expectations. Um, I think he's he's finally found that spot where where he can be most utilized effectively, and, and is doing that well here for this Heat team. Um, seven point seven rebounds, five assists for him last night. Um, Again, Duncan Robinson gave Vincent Max Struess. They always are finding ways to knock down shots when they need to. Um, again, they don't shoot a, a ton of threes, but when they make them at the high efficiency that they do, making 50% of their threes last night, um, all those guys are, are huge players into that. Um, the last guy I want to touch on who I'll start with the good. Uh, Bam's defense this entire postseason has been great. This series – it's been fantastic. They are only even able to run their zone the way that they do because of how versatile he is. They're very comfortable with letting him sit very deep into the paint and not provide a ton of help there um, because they trusted him to make proper decisions um, to be able to protect the rim, to be able to step out when he needs to. Um, so, again, full credit to him. Made an all-defensive team for a reason. Um, but – There is no world where he should be uh, able to be guarded by anybody on this Celtics team that is not Al Horford, Robert Williams, Williams. Mm -hmm. maybe Tatum in occasional circumstances, but even that is pushing it. There was too often, not even just last night. Last night, there was a lot of moments as well, but the series as a whole, there's far too often where Bam is catching the ball and he's got Smart on him. Or he's got Derek White on him. And he's passing the ball. Or he does that floater and I hate when big goes men do to that. work in that mid-range. Look, that is not going to fly against Denver. You can't. If they want any chance at all to compete against Denver, Caleb Martin can't be your second best player. And that's no shade on him, mm -hmm. but Bam has to step it up on the offensive side of the ball because as good as he's played on the defensive end, the Celtics team and this Celtics offense is not Denver. Not so at all. He's going to have a lot – cut out for him on the defensive side of the ball. But like we've said before, sometimes good isn't enough. You have to demand great. And sometimes you got to demand greater than that. And if they want to be competitive in the series and have a chance to continue this Cinderella run, he's going to have to step up on the offensive side of the ball and honestly step up on the defensive side of the ball or else they're going to get ran out of the gym by Denver and Jokic and Jamal and all the players that Denver has in that roster. Unfortunately, I don't see that happening, though. I don't see Bam stepping up offensively. Like, I just – I never was a – I like Bam defensively. Like, he's a great, versatile player. Like, he's a great defender, obviously. But offensively, it's kind of like how we talked about with Anthony Davis, how we need to start looking at these players sometimes as a defender first. Mm -hmm. And everything you give me on the offensive end is a plus. I think that even more with Bam just because he's not as tall. Bam is only like 6'9", I believe. He's not yeah. as tall, so he's playing the five, but he's not like five. He's a little undersized, like, yeah. Yeah, he's an undersized. He's an undersized big, so it's a little bit tougher. I don't think his his offensive skill set is as as good as someone as like Anthony Davis or something like that. But I, I think we just need to start looking at him as a defender first because there's too many times where he's just not aggressive and he's just not giving you much on the offensive end. So it, it's tough because he is their second best player. So unfortunately, like you said. We have no choice but to ask of you to step up. I right. just personally don't think that he really has the offensive skill set to be able to to give them the offense that they might need to beat a Denver. You know what I mean? So it's a, it's a tough. But if you're the Heat, I mean, you have to ask for it. You have to hope that he could just step up and be that offensive guy. That I mean, we we've seen him before. You know what I'm saying? We've seen him be aggressive and have great good offensive games. But on a consistent basis, I feel like that is a little bit of a tough ask for a guy like Bam. Yeah, and, and we can go ahead and pivot to 
now that we have the matchup set, really starting to preview this this finals series as a whole. And again, starting with Bam, I think that look, if Anthony Davis couldn't stop Jokic, I don't know if anyone can. Right. Uh so he's got more than enough of work cut out for him on the defensive side of the ball. And that's just from from an individual matchup perspective. If they're looking to go zone and Jokic is trying to attack that, they're you know, I went back and watched some of the Nuggets clips against Miami this past year. And Jokic likes to, especially when they go zone, post up someone on the outside. He'll catch it kind of high on the, the perimeter. And that means he's going to be looking to start his post up against guys like Duncan Robinson or Max Struess or, you know, somebody else on that perimeter. And, you know, Bam then is going to have to try to help off of that. And with how their offense flows with the motion, how absurdly good of a passer Jokic is, I immediately see that presenting problems for Miami. If they want to go zone, if they go man, one-on-one, -on -one, I don't know anybody that's stopping Jokic right now. Mm -hmm. And – Again, that's no shade to Bam, because there's no shade to Anthony Davis either. I think no, anybody are, in the league, there's nobody right. in the league that can do it. So there's no, no. He's just disrespect to you. Seven foot bruiser with an incredible finesse and Touch. honestly yeah. ridiculous shot making. It's the dumbest threes I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> step back threes, the end quarters. I get no. I'm not even gonna. Yeah, I'm not even get into that. We're, we're not talking about that. That. Purple and gold. Team. I'm not gonna talk about that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I'm very interested to see what Spo brings to the table. But um, another stat that I have here: the the Nuggets were the number one team, number one offense in terms of offensive rating against the zone, against any zone defense, both in the regular season and so far in this, this postseason. Um, now, obviously, the, this postseason they haven't faced. The Heat zone, which has been the most prevalent and far and away the best zone defense um, in the playoffs and probably in the league as a whole. Um, but, again, just for additional context there. Um, and, and that all makes sense, right, with how good of a pass for Jokic is. What you always want against a zone is somebody that can attack the inside and look to, to play make from there. And I don't think you could actually draw or create a better person to do that Literally. than Jokic. Mm -hmm. Um, so interested to see what, what Spo goes with, um, throughout this series. Um, like we've said in a lot of these later series, the chess match is always something that, um, we're excited to see. And you're going to have two of the best coaches in the NBA going at it and, and looking to make adjustments here from game to game. And I, I'm very interested to see what type of schemes, Spo was able to, to throw at Denver because you got to throw the kitchen sink at them, right? You, you've got to try everything. And um, even then it might not work. <laughs> yeah. And, and so I, I'm sure there's going to, we're going to see zone. We're going to see man. We're probably going to see heavy trapping on any type of Jamal Murray uh, pick and roll action. I'd imagine they're going to try to blitz him, get the ball out of his hands, not let him operate freely. Um, there's going to be times where we're going to see doubling on Jokic, especially on the block. Um, like I said, I just don't think there's anybody that can guard him one-on-one -on -one in the league right now. They're going to throw a lot at Denver, and they're going to make them work. But I think I said it prior to game five of this Eastern Conference Finals. I think either team that came out, Denver is just – they're like a, a juggernaut right now. They're a machine. It's they're important. operating on all cylinders. Operating on all cylinders and – now had a week off uh, <laughs> after their their sweep in the Western <laughs> Conference Finals, and so they're going to be rested. They, uh, I'm sure, they probably have been prepping for a heat zone for a couple of days now, just anticipating this being a possible outcome. Right. And so, I just I think it's going to be Denver in six games, and I think it didn't matter who it was going to be; it's going to be Denver in six. I'm anticipating that Miami's going to be able to take one or two strictly off of like heart. 
are going <laughs> to oh, have great. <laughs> right. It's just going to be great schemes. Are going to have force Denver into just an off shooting night, and Jimmy's going to have like forty five and fifteen rebounds. Um, a Jimmy game, yeah. A right. my, my, not Jimmy, a Miami Heat game. One of those yeah. like we. I know what you mean. We're gonna slug it out. We're gonna steal one. So I, I get what you're saying. It, it's gonna be tough because. Like you said, none of them can guard Jokic one on one. Yeah, it's like you go into the zone; he can literally pick you apart with his passing. So it, it's going to be really, really tough. I'm also interested to see how Spolstra does just how how he schemes up a defense to be able to slow down the Denver offense because and it's different going against Denver than it is the Celtics because it's not just okay Denver's going to shoot a bunch of threes and if they're off then okay we win. Like no, they're a very balanced offense. They can kill you in the paint. They can kill you with shooting threes. They have great shot creators like Jamal Murray, who can get his own shot from the mid-range, the three. Like, they can score in so many different ways. They're completely different when it comes to the Celtics. They have a bunch of motion. Like, it's it's a completely different team you guys are going against, being the Miami Heat. But, I mean, if anyone can scheme up some sort of anything to help slow down Jokic, Jamal Murray, this whole offense, it will be Spolster. So, um, I'm curious to see how the, how this series goes. I think – I really want to say Nuggets in five, if I'm being completely honest with you. Yeah. It's, but uh, I'm trying to give – I've been counting the Heat out in every single series they've, they've had this whole postseason, and it's it's just tough. They burn me every single time I picked against them. I'm going to pick against them again. But <laughs> I think I'll give them a little bit of respect. I'll say Nuggets and six. Yeah, I, I think if we've learned anything about this Heat team in this run, it's that there is absolutely no quit. They're never going to lay down. And this this Eastern Conference Finals is telling enough, right? Like, very easily could have packed it in after game six. And they not only came to fight, but dominated the Celtics in game seven on the road. So there's no way they're going to lie down and just let the, the Nuggets walk over them. So I, I think Nuggets in six feels, feels fair. Um, I just – the talent on that Nuggets team is you know, too much. Too much. Yeah. Rested. It's just everything is is skewing in their favor. So um, I still think it will be a, a, an exciting series to watch. Um, I don't care what the TV ratings say. If casuals don't tune in and watch it, oh, well, I don't really love basketball then. I think that's uh, the media's fault, low-key. 100%. Like, it's about how they, they – uh, advertise and sell some of these smaller market teams that aren't the Knicks or the Celtics or the Lakers, right? Um, it's crazy that – and I think Mike Malone is probably overblowing it to an extent with how much he feels like the Nuggets are disrespected, but some of that is rooted in truth. Mm-hmm. And the fact that they have a two-time MVP and are or have been the start to finish one seed really in the West outside of like the first three weeks of the season – um, the fact that you have reporters coming out and saying, "Man, I didn't know Jokic was this good," and Jalen Rose is <laughs> Jalen Rose just is just now entering superstar status. Like, what are right. you talking about? Two bro? MVPs later, <clears throat> two all first team All NBA, you know, selections later. Now he's a superstar, and it's like this. Like, I don't really see why. I mean, I get why the ratings would be lower than like a Lakers Celtics obviously but it's like if you just look at the stories it's like like you said first team or first seat the entire year pretty much rolled through everyone in the west yep. and you have this cinderella story in the east over here it was just grit and hustle and grind and we're gonna win through toughness and yep. and they have beef people forget they have actual beef between each other like they almost fought when Jokic tried to almost, decapitate I think a Morris, they did. <laughs> like he almost and Jokic decapitated a morris brother and then Jimmy Butler saying, "Meet me in the back. Meet me in the back." Kyle Lowry want to like they all wanted to fight. Like this team, they have beef. Like this, bro. This it it goes beef. deeper than that too, because people forget in the bubble, Aaron Gordon and Kyle Lowry got on, got into it when Aaron Gordon was still with Orlando. Did he really? He Aaron, did. Right, he did. Oh, they got into it. Kyle yeah. Lowry, it was perfect. Aaron Gordon was like, 
man, you ain't, you know what I'm saying? You ain't this. Kyle right. Irving said, my room, my room number is 827. Facts. <laughs> Yo, nah, I don't care what nobody say. This could be some, this series could be lit, bro. This series could be something. Like, I, yeah. I, who knows? You guys, you might see some uh, some scuffles here and there, some pushing and shoving, some back talk. It could be something. So, that it's, whole, it's going to be, be a gritty, it's going to be a grinded out series for sure. For sure. Mm-hmm. 100%. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, look, they better get security for Jokic brothers because you know they're gonna be they're gonna be they're in the building sick. in Miami. They got just gonna be in sitting posted up like they're looking with the black shirts in just like that. <laughs> they got some bounces, bro. Yeah, the bodyguards are are in the arena for sure. Oh, for real. I ain't messing with no big Serbians, bro. I'm straight. Like, they, I ain't they about the no same problem. size as Jokic? <laughs> Even if they're not, they're gonna be at least like what six, seven, six, eight. Right. The big Serbians. I'm straight, bro. I'm good. Yeah. I don't want no problems with that. You got it, bro. Right. Yeah. I, keep that over there. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm I'm super excited for the series. Um, I think I, I'm expecting reports are gonna come out that viewership is down from last year or down from previous finals. And it's gonna be one of the lower view, lower rated viewership finals that we've seen in a while. Mm-hmm. And I think part of that, like we already said, is due to the media, but some of it is just less people watch sports in the same way that we used to. I think this is a little bit off topic, but I feel like we need to get away from using that as a benchmark for how good a product is or how good a, a series was, how entertaining it was, or how much people are interested in it. Because I would imagine there's probably a lot of people in high school, just like teenage, like probably somewhere between that, like 14 to like 20 age range. A lot of them probably don't watch the games live. They probably go and watch highlights. They go and listen people to talk the, about them. They go and listen to the off the glass podcast, right? <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. And listen to people talk about it, but they might not sit down and watch the game as it's happening. Um, and that just is a, a viewership habit, a trend among people in an age group. Like they're shifting away from watching it on broadcast or stream and shifting to social media, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, whatever it is. Um, so the viewership may be down, but I don't think that's going to take away from what I think is going to be an exciting finals. There's tons of great storylines here. The media can definitely sell it better and can definitely cover it better because I, the guy from sports illustrated, I think is Chris Mannix. Maybe I don't, I don't want to misquote it, but I know he works for, for sports illustrated came out and said that he thought that the nuggets were a boring team. There's nothing to cover. There's no story for the nuggets, which I think is lazy, just lazy right. and lousy, right? Like mm-hmm. there's a two time MVP. That was a second round draft pick on that team. There's somebody on the team that tore his ACL and missed almost two seasons of basketball and has come back and is they're clearly the second best player, one of the best playoff risers we've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Right. Michael Porter Jr. Played what, like 10 games in college and messed up a disc in his back. And they thought he may never play Mm -hmm. basketball again. He might be the draft because of it. Right. He might be a third option on a championship team. Aaron Gordon's having a career revitalization, had a completely new role from what he did in, in Orlando. Mm-hmm. Now here in Denver, that's just four guys: Bruce Brown, Christian Brown is playing well as a like. There's so many storylines and angles. I don't want to hear that. There's nothing to cover. That's just lazy. That just means there's no drama. That's all. That's really what he's talking about. There's no. It's, it's not even there's no, no drama. off the court drama. There's no like. There's no LeBron. There's no Curry. There's no. That's there's nothing that is. people. It they is don't have no LeBron. No Curry. No, exactly. It's not flashy, and that's also I feel like. Is somewhat of a problem. I was listening to JJ Reddick talk about that a little bit. He was like, "Do you think the NBA has like a LeBron and Curry problem? That like once those guys leave, it's like people's gonna be like, oh well, my favorite players aren't in it. Like I don't really care anymore. Like there's plenty. Listen, I got family members that's like, he they asked me like, did the Lakers win? I was like, no. What are you talking about? They're like, oh, like they they're LeBron fans. They just right. wanted to know like, did we win? They didn't. They don't really care. They didn't really watch it, but they know LeBron. They know Curry. They know all these guys. So I feel like um. The the non ha- not having the flashy names, the big names is part of the reason why a lot of people seem like or feel like they don't really want to watch like the Nuggets, the Heat, things like that. Yeah, it's, it's it's tough. It is what it is. Yeah, and I think 
I, honestly, there's, there's a lot of drawbacks to what social media has done, like on the whole on society, but even just in the sports perspective and looking at the NBA, uh, you have a lot more people that can voice bad opinions, really negative opinions. But what it's also opened up is the lanes to let people have more outlets to choose where they want to interact with the NBA at. Not everything is going to be done, and it's only going to continue to trend in this direction. Less and less people are going to go to ESPN or Bleach Report or any of the larger media outlets for their sports coverage. More and more people are going to probably tune into YouTube podcasts and, and opt to get their, you know, their fill and their NBA content that way. Um, because there's more options. There's going to be different personalities, get different, different feels, different vibes. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's, it has this, you know, it's drawbacks, but I think that's probably one of the more overwhelming positives of, you know, where the social media space is going, the podcasting space, YouTube as a whole. So, yeah, that, I hope it gets better. I hope that they give both of these teams their flowers as the, the finals go on because this postseason as a whole, like when we look back on this in a few years, it's just going to be like, this was special. Like this was special what we're witnessing right now mm -hmm. with the, the run that the Heat have gone on and the dominance that the Nuggets have shown. So, yeah, all, all I can hope for is a, a competitive series, a good series, but um, we both have the Nuggets in six. I just don't see a world where that team loses, man. They look too complete. Like it's just, I just feel like it's a thing of like, there's no need to overcomplicate it. Like, yeah, they're the yeah. best team. They've looked like the best team. They've been the most consistent team. They have the best player in the world, arguably. Yeah. Yeah, I don't see them losing. Looking around the league at some of the, the, the news that's dropped since we last recorded. First one a few days ago, uh, the Bucks had narrowed down their um, coaching search to Nick Nurse. Adrian Griffin, who's one of Nick Nurse's assistants in Toronto, and then Kenny Atkinson, who's an assistant in Golden State, used to be the coach in, in Brooklyn. Um, they ended up going with Nick Nurse's assistant over him. So Adrian Griffin is going to be the new coach there in Milwaukee. Um, I believe all three of them had individual meetings with Giannis, um, and Giannis gave his blessing to the organization to, to sign Adrian Griffin. So, A, I think Smart move on them, especially mm -hmm. with him being a free agent after this upcoming season. Everything you can to keep him on your good side. And right. obviously, as a smaller market team, you want to keep your star. So um, I don't know too much about him, but uh, clearly Giannis was, was happy with what he saw. Um, so interested to see what the direction that he takes the Bucks moving forward. Um, and with Nick Nurse pulling out of the, the running for the Bucks job, he goes and gets signed by the Philadelphia 76ers, which I think is a steal. I did not think he would get that job. I almost thought he was a shoe in for the Milwaukee job. Um, so for them to grab Nick Nurse, I think is going to do wonders for them. Um, they don't have Doc anymore, so they don't have that excuse moving forward. So No more scapegoat. Right. Got a brand new coach in there. A good one. Right. We, we know what he's able to do, a championship winning coach, coach mm -hmm. of the year. Um, he might play Joel Embiid 47 minutes a game. Sure. In the regular season, <laughs> <Right. you know? laughs> That's Joel my only Embiid. concern. <laughs> yeah, Joel Embiid, he better hit the gym now and start the running. His knees better hold up. He you saw the notification. I know he saw the notification. His knee just, just shivered. <laughs> uh, but but no, on a serious note, I really do think he's gonna he's gonna be able to do a lot for them uh, defensively. I hope. Um, I think he'll utilize guys like uh, McDaniel's really well. I uh, I'm, I'm gonna say is Jalen. I always get the two the two names mixed up. Uh, mm -hmm. But Jalen McDaniel's really well because I, I, I was surprised that he didn't get more run. Um, and their postseason, their postseason stretch this past past year. So, um, I think Nick Nurse will be able to tap into his development there. Um, we know what he was able to put together in Toronto with 
any and every lengthy wing defender. Well, like, so, yeah. <laughs> right. um, so I think that's going to be great, great for him moving forward. Uh, and interesting to see what he do, does with Joel and, and how he tries to scheme their team um, around his offense and his, his dominance on the interior moving forward. Um, and hopefully that means posting him up in closeout games. <laughs> Get on the block. Stop <laughs> being on the perimeter. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious um, to see it too if uh if that has any impact on whether James Harden comes back or not. Yeah, yeah. I uh I don't know. I, I've heard so many rumblings that him to Houston is a for real thing. I if saw he goes to Houston, he's just packing it up and he's like, I just want to have fun for the rest of my career. I don't even care about winning rings anymore. I just want to have fun. Yeah, and he I mean, he's got restaurants in Houston. He's got his jersey retired in he's downtown. A legend. Yeah, jersey retired in the club. <laughs> um, <laughs> them, them, uh, oh my god, them Houston strippers gonna be happy. He go back. <laughs> and go, oh my god, they gonna uh, be happy. So, yeah, I, I know that they want to bring a vet in. Now, I'm not sure if that's the <laughs> the, the best vet for a young team, but. <laughs> But for all, all jokes aside, I, I think he yeah, he makes that move to go back to Houston. It's not – we know where his priorities are, right? Mm. He's choosing the lifestyle. He's choosing his comfortability. And I, like, it's all fair and good. Like, hey, which is you not do you, bad right? Thing. You right. Don't, not, not everyone has to be like my legacy. I'm chasing – like right. not everyone has to do that. If you're content, if you're happy in life, do whatever, do whatever you want. Right. And at the end of the day – him being there is probably going to be somebody great for Jalen Green to, to learn behind. Mm-hmm. Um, people have come out, I think Bruce Brown recently came out and said that James Harden was one of the best people he's ever been with in a locker room. Um, he felt like after he left in Brooklyn, a lot of their team morale dropped and just the locker room wasn't the same. Um, so, you know, I think he'll actually be somebody good for you know Jalen Green to learn behind um, and just be good for that team as a whole. Um, to just continue to develop. It's not going to catapult them into contention or anything, but um, right. like I said, if he's comfortable with it, um, it'll be good for some of their young guys and, and good for the, the city definitely to to bring him back. Um, I don't know. You think they'll embrace him? Because he kind of forced his way out of Houston. They'll embrace him just because of so, uh, what he did for Houston. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. he did force his way out, but I mean, he's coming back. I, they're they're gonna embrace him. I, I don't think they'll be cold to him by any means. Like, I don't think if you ask the Houston men, do you want James Harden back, they'll be like, no, not at all. Like unless they really felt like it would stunt the growth of their young guys, that's the only way I could see them not wanting him back. But as far as the city embracing him, I feel like he's done so much for the city of Houston. I I think they'll definitely want him back. I saw a mock trade that had Houston sending the fourth round pick to Toronto. And the getting, overall pick, yeah, oh. and they would be getting back Pascal. And so the, the the Raptors kind of going into like a what would be like a really quick rebuild, right? Um, and moving off of Pascal, and then the Rockets all of a sudden, and this would be in addition to getting Harden, right? Then you have I, okay. Harden, yeah. Pascal, Jalen Green, um. I can't remember. Let me see if I can pull up the, the trade. But it, one or two of their young pieces were, were also involved. So they would be losing like KPJ with probably Sorry, Easton right? or maybe school. Yeah. Okay. So then it would so it'd be James, Jalen Green, it'd be Siakam, it would be Jabari. And uh Sangoon. Sangoon, I mean, yeah. That's a, that's a nice team. I mean, they're obviously not winning anything, but I mean it's definitely better than how they've been, you know what I mean? They wouldn't be absolutely garbage. Then you have Ime in there. Um yeah. who could help coach these guys up, help develop these young guys. It really depends on how these young guys develop. That's actually that's not a bad team though. Team is not bad. But Jalen Green can actually develop, take that next step. Um Stan Goon can develop a little bit. That that's not a bad team. Yeah, there's been a lot a lot of rumblings, rumors about teams reaching out to the Raptors for um Siakam. The Blazers have reached out. The Rockets have reached out. Um, the Nets and the Warriors also in talks. 
Um, so it seems like Siakam may legitimately be on the move this offseason, and, and the Raptors may look to go um, bring in a new coach and just start kind of fresh around their younger core with Scotty, um, which I, I think may be the right move. I think that any moves that they make around the current roster that they have now are a little lateral. Um, and I don't think yeah. they, they have enough right now to really get them back into contention. Um, and so I think that makes sense. And, you know, if you can get off of Siakam, get some young guys in return, get some draft capital back um, and, and build around Scotty that way, I think that that could, could prove to be the right move for Toronto in the long run. So definitely got to see what, what, what comes out of that around the draft for sure. I, I'm always – in agreement with teams that make those type of moves because they know that they don't really have enough to win a championship, but we're not bad enough to where we're going to get the players to develop into championship, like make us a championship level team. So I'm always in agreement with those type of moves. Yeah. Um, another big piece of news that actually came out right before we started recording. Uh, I know we've talked about the rumors for the past few weeks now, but it is now official. Bob Myers is stepping down as the franchise's president and general manager in Golden State. Um, he told ESPN, it's just time. Um, and so, as we've alluded to many times here on the pod, you know, Golden State has a huge offseason in front of them with a lot of questions that have to get answered from multiple extensions, different trade targets, players that may need to get traded, um, and just their outlook on the future as a whole and, and what they can get out of the last few years of – you know, the core between Draymond, Steph, and Clay. So losing Bob Myers at this time is probably added 15, 20 more questions into that scenario because on top of everything that they need to do from a personnel standpoint, now they need to find out who's going to make those personnel decisions. So Exactly. They, uh, their offseason just got even more exciting as a fan, but probably stressful if you're a Warriors fan. <laughs> Right. Um. So definitely uncertain. Got a lot. Way more uncertain. You don't know who. You don't. I don't. You don't know what move they're gonna make. There's a lot of different directions that they can go. So yeah, it's gonna be a tough one if you're a Warriors fan. Yeah, it is. Uh, and they Warriors fans think they're getting everybody too. That's what makes it even funnier. Like they, oh yeah, we can get Siakam. I've seen. <laughs> I've seen like. I mean, a lot of this is just like pro Warrior fans that I've seen. But like, I've seen like. Jay, oh, we're getting Jalen Brown this offseason. I'm like, how? <laughs> like, how, <laughs> how are you guys doing all this? Like, where's all this money coming from? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, uh, a fan base is always have the, we, we can get everybody, know. everything. I, say, I can't even speak because my, listen, I, I get happy every time I see a Damian Lillard in the Lakers uniform, I see a, whoever in the Lakers uniform, I'll be like, you know what, make it happen. But so I get it. It's just kind of funny to see. We we've definitely reached um, Photoshop season. Yeah, jersey swaps everywhere. Bro, Photoshop season is the funniest thing in the <laughs> world, bro. Could you see the most great, like the most stuff that is never gonna happen ever? Like I seen yeah. Tatum in a Warriors win last night. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, bro, what are we talking about right now? Photoshop season is hilarious. Like, it's too funny. And it's funny because a lot of those fans really, like, if, if you ever see me repost one of those or like one, I'm just joking. I'm joking. Like, I, yeah. I'm not an idiot. A lot of those people don't really believe, like, yo, make it happen. Like, let's go get Giannis to the Warriors. Like, or something crazy like that. It's hilarious. Yeah. They, they uh, I've seen, I think somebody did a thread of, like, a, Brooke Lopez jersey swaps over the years. There was like twelve or fifteen of them. It's like there's somebody on Photoshop right now just putting jerseys on every single star player, right? Having them ready to go for any rumor. So a beat writer in <laughs> Portland could just be like, Portland's looking to try to compile a package to trade for insert any superstar. They've Literally. got the jersey swap ready to go. Literally. Um. Another another thing that Bleacher Report put out this past week that I wanted to get your opinion on. They did a full redraft for the 2020 draft. Um, just the top 10 picks, actually. But um, they took LaMelo Ball first. Um, so switching. Over them. Ant? Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> that, was, that was the first question okay. I was going to ask. What do, you, what do you think about that? 
No, absolutely not. Anthony Edwards is a better player than LaMelo Ball. What are we talking? That's not I didn't even expect that to be one of the things. I thought it was gonna be like, you know, switch LaMelo and Wiseman, but over Anthony Edwards? No, that's what? Why would Wiseman, that, that is, even, Wiseman is not in this top ten. He shouldn't be at this point. But why yeah. that doesn't even make sense though, because at that time, didn't they have D'Lo? Did they have D'Lo already on the team at that time, or they had a point guard? Even if they did, even if I they think didn't. So. they went for fit over talent by taking Wiseman because they no no, no, no I'm be, saying um, oh. uh with I was saying the Minnesota why would they take Lamelo over Anthony Edwards? Then they have a point oh. guard at that time. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think this is just like no team at- attachments, just like okay, just players, just like right, just like basically like re ranking the players. In terms of who they think is best, yeah, still down. So, <laughs> I, yeah, I agree. I, think <laughs> I would take Ant. Still, I think that's still the right choice. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they're still like they're both still young. There's still lots of time and upside for that to change. But yeah, we're talking right now. What we've seen from Ant, look, Ant's that guy, bro. Ant, Ant is that Ant, guy. Ant took one. LeBron ain't take one from the Nuggets. Uh, hey, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. Ain't got that dog in him, bro. I'm not listening. And is nice. I I can see him developing into like one of those like I'm one of the best guys in the league type of guys because what he's doing already being this young and mm-hmm. just like you hear him talk, you hear him in interviews, just to hear his mindset, the way right. he's like, I want to guard the best player. Like I want to go at the best players. Like I, I can yeah. definitely see Ant coming or turning into one of those like top five guys in the league when he hits his prime. Yeah, and we've already started to see different. You know, moments in time where he's gone late game and he's taken that assignment to go and guard the best player. And so he's mm-hmm. making a for real effort to try to become a legitimate two way ball stopper and one of the best scorers in the league. Yeah. Um, so he's trending on a, a very, very high trajectory. So another uh, one of Michael Jordan's sons. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> his, when they do those little side by side, his is they, crazy. I, I, <laughs> saw, just I, like him. I saw someone Photoshop him bald, and I was like, man, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah, know. It's crazy. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. I think they, I would still take Anthony Edwards over LaMelo. Um, three through five in this Bleacher Report redraft, they have Tyrese Halliburton, Desmond Bain, and then Tyrese Maxey. Um, I think there's an argument to be made to maybe put Tyrese Maxey over Desmond Bain, but I'm not super mad mm. or picky. I'm not going to. It's that not one's as right. Man. right. Yeah. yeah. Um, these next five, I think, could be swapped around a lot. At six, they have Emmanuel quickly. Seven is Obi Toppin, which I think is a little surprising. Um, but – I was looking at some of the other players in the draft. And it kind of makes sense. Um, eight is in Yeko Kongu. Nine is Sadiq Bay. And then at 10, they have Devin Vassell. And I think, honestly, there's an argument to be made that Devin Vassell could be better than all the people in front of him from all the way up until the sixth pick. So he could be in front of Sadiq Bay, and Yeko, Obi Toppin, and Manuel Quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, again, Devin Vassell is a guy that small market in San Antonio doesn't get as much media coverage, but um, has really developed into um, a great two way player, really great catch and shoot shooter, um, motion shooter, has a, just a very fluid pull up game. Um, I think he's overall underappreciated uh, in the NBA community. I, I could, I think <laughs> I would be comfortable putting him above all of those guys that I just listed um, mm. in this, this setting. And obviously he ended up going 11th in the actual draft. So um, I think the highest jump here is Tyrese maybe because Tyrese was 12th and they have him going third. But he was 12. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, well, actually no, Desmond Dane because Devin, Desmond Dane was the last pick of the first round. Oh, he was. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. And, uh, and Tyrese was 21st. <laughs> yep. I just put it. Yeah. But the Devin was, yeah. I, I'll definitely let you speak on that a little bit more. You definitely watch way more San Antonio than I have. I'm not going to – I'm never going to sit and act like – I'm not going to make nothing up, act like I've watched all the San Antonio games. But, yeah, a lot of – I can see where they're coming from with some of these picks. Mm-hmm. Like the OB Toppin, 
I get like no nothing for me it was outrageous, but besides the Lamella Ball one, that was the only one I was like, what are yeah. we talking about right now? But I mean, I can see where they're coming from with a lot of these picks. Some of that feels potential based, right? Especially if you're gonna That's have yeah. OB above Devin Vassell, guys like Anyeka above Devin Vassell, like Devin just has a bigger role than both of those guys. Um, mm-hmm. but I think in this postseason, particularly, like we've seen. Obi Toppin, when he did get extended minutes, have yeah. more production for the Knicks. And so I think they're trying to, you know, forecast out a little bit. Um, same thing with Anyeka. I think we're fast approaching that timeline where they may swap him and Clint out because um, I think he just provides more athleticism. Obviously, he's a little mm-hmm. bit more undersized. But um, I really have liked what I've seen from Onyeka the past two seasons. And I think he continues to make jumps and developments in his game. Um, on, on both sides of the ball. So not going to spend too much time on it, but I, I do think they could have – I think they're projecting out a little bit more. But Yeah, um, which I can see the potential of some of these guys, like you said. Right. Um, the last thing I wanted to do on today's pod, um, now that we have got the finals matchup set, um, I want to go ahead and make the all postseason team. Um, which is I, I low-key kind of wish is something that the NBA did. That would be kind of fire. That would um, be cool. That's a great idea. I never thought of that. That's a fire idea. All right. And you could keep it, you could keep it small, one or two teams, and just have do it the same setup as they're going to next year, where you have, you know, two backcourt players, three front court players. So you get, you know, four guards and what is that, eight forwards and centers. Mm-hmm. Um, so I won't go through and just think. If we had to put together a, a all M, all NBA postseason team for this year's playoffs, who would we put on the list? And we can go Ooh. ahead and get to some of the obvious ones out of the way, right? Okay. So first team center. I'm gonna write. I'm gonna write this down just so we remember. Yeah, first team down. center. Nikola Jokic is <laughs> without yeah. question. Easily. <laughs> um. That's probably the most no-brainer one. Mm-hmm. Um, so we do we doing center four four guard guard. Like you want to do it like that, or you just want to do like front court and back court. You got, get since since they did all NBA teams this year still with center forward forward and two guards. We'll, we'll do it that, that way. Yeah. Uh, so first okay. team center, Nikola Jokic. Mm-hmm. I think that that's the easiest selection. Obvious. Then we have got two Who forward does? spots. And there's a couple of arguments that you can make here. I'm just trying I, to remember because I'm trying to remember everyone who was in the postseason, not just these guys that lasted the longest. I, I'm definitely going to weigh heavier people that played more. So yeah, like, for sure. In terms 100%. of points per game, Kawhi still is averaging the most points per game. <laughs> he was hooping though, but right. we, as, he we can't like two have games. him up there. Yeah, we can't have him up there. Uh, so as far as forwards, we could have you could put Tatum up there. You could put – got to put Jimmy. Jimmy got to be in one of those. See, so, right, so then that puts – there's three guys for two spots because I would say you can put Tatum, you mm-hmm. put Jimmy, but I guess AD doesn't count, right, because he plays center. He have to be a center. Exactly. He has, he to, has be to be the center. center. He's gonna, I, I, I was going to say that. He's going to be the second yeah. center. So, okay, so, Timmy – or Timmy, <laughs> Tatum <laughs> and Jimmy. Yeah, they got to um, be out there. Yeah, I feel fair. I don't. I can't think of anybody else that really I would put over them. Guard is tough. Guard, Guard is tough. I, oh, this is hard because it's like a guy like say like a guy like Fox was hooping, right? But he was only in the first round, so it's like you can't. I don't know if you could put him over Curry because Curry at least made it to the second round. Then you got a guy like Jamal who's in the final. Now, this is hard. Hold on, hold on. This is tough. And you didn't even mention D Book. Oh, this is mad hard. Oh, my God. I feel like Book has to be first team. Right. His I feel like he got to be first crazy. team. Yeah. Because I, he, he has to be first team. All right. Book got to be one of those. Yeah. Okay, Book. Cool. Then the point guard. This is so tough, bro. Because it's not like – and I don't want to do this off a name. Like, I really want to be like, who played the best in these playoffs? Right. Like, 
Uh, so so who's it between? It's between Curry. I feel like Curry would have to get the nod over like a Fox. So I feel like Fox right. can't be first team. I think it's really between Curry and Jamal. Jamal averaged what thirty in the Western Conference Finals. I'm gonna pull up their two stats side by side so we can really really dissect this and solidify the first team. This postseason, Steph averaged thirty and a half points. Six assists, five rebounds, and a steal on 46% from the field, 36% from three in 13 games. Jamal Murray is averaging 28 points, six assists, five and a half rebounds, almost two steals on 40 minutes, 48% from the field, 40% from three, 93% from the free throw line. Sheesh. I feel like this one, it is based off of – like, the only thing that's – like, Jamal obviously has a nod because they're in the finals. Like, he obviously made it farther. But Curry shouldered more weight than Murray did. Yeah. And he played arguably like – I mean, ugh, this is tough. I, I'm going I'm to give you some of their best stat lines from this playoff, too. Obviously, the biggest one for Steph, game seven against Sacramento. 50 mm-hmm. points, eight rebounds, six assists, shot 52% from the field, 38% from three. Broke the record, held the record for like a week. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, he also had 36 in game three of that series um, and had 31 and 32 in game four and game six. Both of those were losses, though, in the Lakers series. Go to Jamal mm-hmm. Murray. Jamal Murray had the 40-piece in the first round against Minnesota. That feels like years ago at this point. Right. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, had, had 40 against Minnesota on 60% from the field, 60% from three, 35, 35 points in the closeout game of that series. He had 34 points in game one against Phoenix, 32 in game three, which was a, a close loss. Um, and then in the Lakers series – 31 points in game one, back-to-back 37-point games in game two and game three, um, and then had 25 points on 18 shots in game four, um, and averaged almost three steals a game in the Western Conference Finals. I feel that Murray might have to get denied, bro. That's kind of where I'm leaning to. I feel like – go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, it's not – it's not – just because he played more games, but it's like in the games that he did play, he did so much. Right. Right. Like in in the Lakers series, and it's not like obviously we're looking at just an individual accolade thing. Like Steph mm-hmm. tried, but like the Lakers are able to key in on him so much more because his team level of play regressed right. so much. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that hurts him because then you know, when you look at his shooting splits for this Lakers series, 10 for 24, 7 for 12, 9 for 21, 12 for 30, 12 for 24, and then 11 for 28 in the, the game six. Um, so it's just, Jamal Murray was shooting a lights out that he whole had Lakers series. 30 points per game in the Western Conference Finals on nah, 50, we... 40, 90. It's just – that's – didn't he have what, what? How much did he score in that first half? Wasn't he, he had like, a, didn't, didn't he, he have a thirty point half? Yeah. Now nah, we gotta do Jamal. I was, it, it got because I I feel like if the roles were reversed, if Curry did what Jamal did and he's in the finals right now, it wouldn't even be like a discussion. Like what we're saying, like name wise. I, I think like if Curry did what Jamal did, even in just the two series, I would comfortably pick Curry. Yeah. But like the you know he has the huge series against Sacramento, has the dominant game seven, breaks the record, and then. Mm-hmm. They as a team collectively, but him included, struggling that Lakers series where Jamal has been every single series he's had his games, his moments where it was a Jamal Murray game. Jokic takes a back seat. Right. Um, so I, I think Jamal Murray could get the nod here for first team guard. Ooh. So we got Jokic, we got Tatum, we got Jimmy, Book, mm-hmm. and Jamal. So we do are you want to do all three teams? I think we should just do two. Three feels two? like we're gonna, we're okay. gonna get it's gonna get too too right, too, bad, too bad, many bad. players. 
All right. So I feel like center has Second, to be Anthony Davis. Yeah. I feel yeah, like I AD and Steph feel like those are good. Okay, so um, we'll go we'll go center, then we'll go the front. Right, I'll just put in Steph because we know we're gonna say Steph. Right. So we got AD. So the forwards. Now, this one's gonna get interesting. See, we got we got KD's one could be one of them. Yeah, he struggled so much in that. He did. That, uh, Bron. I feel yeah. like because we already got Tatum and Jimmy, I feel like Bron. Oh, this is so tough. You know what I just realized? Ooh. We've only got one guard spot left. And and, you know who I was about to say? Who? Jalen Brunson. That's what I'm right. And so it's <laughs> him, him or De'Aaron Fox. It's like, mm, that's hard. That's hard. So between, all right, let's, let's figure out this guard. So between Brunson and Fox, mm-hmm. obviously Brunson made it farther. Yeah, Brunson outplayed D. Mitch and Garland. Even in the game, even in the, his last two games against the Heat, didn't he have like back to back forty balls? He played forty eight minutes to even force Game Six, and then in Game Six, drop. He made more field goals in Game Six than the rest of the Knicks combined. Forty one, four and three, and he shot. Almost 60, 50, 90 from the field. He shot 63.6% from the field, 50% from three, and 88.9% from the free throw line. He might have to get the nod, bro. And he only sat three minutes. He sat three minutes in two basketball games combined. He might he might have to get the nod, bro. Which is <laughs> it's tough because it's hurting me because man, I know you love Fox. Fox <laughs> I know you uh, love Fox. Uh, it's it's just he he made it around further. Now, to be fair, if Fox never got hurt, though, I feel like he, that is true. He yeah. could have been having way b- bigger games in the he in the was, latter half of that series. Bro, he was light in the Warriors. If I'm looking at it again, bro, thirty eight mm-hmm. points in Game One, and he was and he was going shot for shot with Steph. He was he was going sick, bro. Uh, I don't. I think Brunson might have to get the nod, bro. And he, I mean, and he went out to a team that's in the finals. Uh, yeah, it's like Fox went out to the Warriors, who got smacked up by the Lakers. So who like, oh, that went and got swept by the Nuggets? <laughs> exactly. So it's like, uh, I, I, I think I'd lean Brunson if we had if we were choosing between those two. Yeah, I think I just talked myself into Brunson too. <laughs> The play, the playing all the minutes thing that got me like playing yeah. all the minutes and dropping forty that that's tough. So we got we got Steph, Jalen, we got eighty. So we we only need the two front court guys. The only right. options are between so between KD, uh, LeBron. Well, I'm gonna tell Jordan. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna toss a name. I guess. Who did they? Who, let me go look at their starting lineup because they started. He could really slide at the three. This is why we need to go. I'm glad that they're going to position list. They're a little bit more <laughs> loose because Anthony Edwards also he hooped in those Ooh, five games. Man, he was he was in his bag, but I, I think he would classify as a guard. He would be like a shooting guard. I don't know. I don't. Well, didn't they start Nikhil Alexander Walker for some of those games? Because then it would be yeah, Mike actually. Mike Conley, Mike and Nikhil, and and Nikhil. Oh, so he ah, uh, so really, I think not even like on some like Lakers fan bias. I think LeBron would have to be in there because they made to the Western Conference Finals. Had a forty point. Oh, actually, he was playing. He was shooting terribly, though. He, yeah, he was he, shooting. Big. We <laughs> look. We we were we were on this podcast and said Anthony Davis was the best player. That is on true. The Lakers that after the the Grizzlies. But series. we also said Devin Booker was the best player on the Suns, and KD was he was I like he wasn't really he wasn't really doing too like he obviously still had his great games, but uh, man, KD uh, to me. I would put him 
on this team just because of how rough that second round series was for him. Like he definitely there, did struggle. Even in the game where he put up a lot of points, it is just like it's weird to see KD be that inefficient. He had 39, mm-hmm. but he shot 12 for 31. That's, yeah. Like he did he did finish up shooting 45% from the field, which is again still lower for KD standards, but not terrible. He did finish 22% from three. He didn't make a three in game five or game six of that series. He didn't? No. He didn't even shoot a three in game six. I got to look up uh, Ant's playoffs. Uh, I, don't, I don't even I got it. Yeah, I got it right here. What's, all right, what's his, what's his numbers? He's averaging this postseason. So he played the five games, 31.6 points. Five rebounds, five assists, two blocks, and basically two steals, too. On 48, 48% from the field, 35% from three. <sighs> he might, he low key might have to be in there. 31. He stole, he took, listen, like I said, this is all bias aside. He took one. Lakers couldn't get, Bron couldn't get one. He, he didn't just take one. He took Aaron Gordon's ankles. They're still in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> right there on the three-point line. Shifted Ooh. him and grabbed one game from Minnesota. So are we say so are we saying Ant is a lock in there? I don't know if he's a lock. So we have who do we have on the second team? Locked is Brunson, Curry, and We just got the guards in the center. Brunson, Curry, AD. And we're looking at Anthony Edwards, KD. And Bron. and Bron. It was the only three that really qualified. So one of them got – so who had a worse playoffs between Andy uh, – not Andy Davis, Andy cool. Edwards, Bron, and KD? I know we already harped on it to start, but the fact that Jalen Brown hasn't even got mentioned is crazy. <laughs> that is unbelievable. <laughs> he just – had he can't. He hasn't, he hasn't played good enough. It's, yeah. On him. It's all good. Are you going to get 300 mil this all season? It's all good, bro. He'll be fine. He wouldn't qualify for our team. Our All-NBA. <laughs> um, it, I feel like... I feel like Braun has to be up there. Who, Braun, right? Right. And it's not even like... Like, his postseason efficiency aside... You know, 24 points a game, 10 rebounds, six and a half assists, a block and a steal. And then just some of the individual performances that we got, um, with the biggest one being game six against the Warriors, 30 points on 10 for 14. That Mm -hmm. was such a, like, legacy, not legacy, like a, throwback kind of game for LeBron. Like, vintage. Vintage, yeah. I couldn't think of the right word. Mm-hmm. Um, 39 and 9 with a block and two steals. Efficient. He was getting to the basket. He was making all the right reads. Um, getting his teammates involved. And then obviously, you know, play all 48 minutes in an elimination game against Denver. And almost had a 40-point triple-double at the age of 38 with one turnover. I, so, I, I, look, if it's between the conversation then, I feel like if we're going to put KD, LeBron, and Ant in the in that three, those three for the last two spots, mm-hmm. I feel like at least I would put LeBron over KD. So, LeBron automatically has to be in. All right. So now it's between Katie and Ant. Katie and Ant. Which is if Ant made it to the second round, this wouldn't even be a discussion. Like, yeah. Like, but it's like he like we said, he played the number one seed. So can you fault him for losing in the first round when he played number one seed? And at the end of the day, this is all individual numbers. Like right. obviously there's some like eye test stuff that goes into it as far as when you watch the games, even if they lose, you know what I'm saying? Did they do well? Did they impact the game? 
Ant was he was hooping, bro. Average more points. Mm. KD did put up he put up twenty eight a night in the first round, twenty nine and a half in the second round, but just bad efficiency. This is tough. And slow key. He almost averaged four turnovers a game. Which he had a lot of turnovers in that Denver series. Um, seven in game one, five in game four, and five, four in game six. Honestly, he had a he had almost 40 turnovers in two series. It's a lot. Damn, that is a lot. God damn. He had seven turnovers in game one? Yeah. Seven, five, five, four. Uh, and I feel like a lot of his, his, like you said, his scoring was, it wasn't efficient at all. A lot of it was at the free throw. It was throw just line. value. Yeah, yeah, it was just, uh, I don't know. I, I'm I'm kind of leaning in. I'm not opposed to putting KD in, KD in there, but I'm leaning Ant, to be honest. Trying to look at like their each. I'm trying to look at just yeah. each game. They both played the Nuggets. So I'm trying to look at each game versus the Nuggets. But they both played them. So Man, at the end of the day, it's our list. That is and, true. Hey, look, <laughs> if I want to give Anthony nod, I feel like we can give Anthony nod because he say, say no more. He tried. He he sure did try to not get swept, and he succeeded. So we got. <clears throat> All, all, what is it? All playoff team, basically all yeah. NBA playoff team, twenty twenty three. First team, we have Jokic, Tatum, Jimmy, Devin Book, Jamal Murray. Then team two, we got Anthony Davis, LeBron, Anthony Edwards, Jalen Brunson, and Steph. I feel like that's a good list. Yeah, I Great agree. List. I agree. We got all the TikTok comments. Oh my god, how, how could you possibly leave Kevin Durant? Oh my god, how could you possibly leave this person? Like, bro, shut up. No Trey Young, no Austin, no Austin Reeves, no Austin Reeves, no Austin Reeves. <laughs> this list is bro, this list is bad, bro. No Austin Reeves, are you crazy? Uh, Trey Young, look, he had 29, 29 points a game on decent efficiency, forty percent from the field, thirty three percent from three. We cannot put it, but it's it, the guards was the toughest, not the toughest. Yeah, yeah. The guards it was the hardest to make it because no yeah. one was playing better than Book Jamal. You're not getting over Jamal, not over Steph. And if anyone, if anyone was getting it, like in replace in replace of like Brunson or somebody, it would have been, been Fox, right? Yeah. So, but that's tough. Honorable mention could be Trey Young because he really did have he averaged basically thirty and ten with two steals a game, not very efficiencies, but and he had the game winner. In Boston, in Boston just, he did. You can't defend home court against anybody these days. Who do you think had a better series, Trey Young or Fox? Better both series, first yeah. Um, that's tough. I want to say Fox, but that might be a little biased. But just I feel like it was that series was so hyped up going into it. And then it delivered, and like every single game was just like a banger after banger after banger. Um, so I, I kind of want to leave Fox, but Trey Young had a good, like a good playoff run as a whole. Like they yeah. just honestly lost yeah. to a better team, but he he's he puts up thirty and ten like kind of effortlessly and in his sleep. And it's kind of, I think, getting too disrespected these days. Like, like people talk just... about Trey Young like he's not, like, like obviously not like he's trash, but like, people, yeah, I see, I see what you mean. People don't put enough respect on Trey he's, Young. That's what he puts up. To me, he's starting to get into that space that people were with with Devin Booker, where they were like, yeah, you could put up thirty a game, but it's empty stats. Like, I feel like people almost want to lump Trey Young into that. It's like, man, first of all, it's tough in the NBA to be uh, the engine of any offense like he is. He's doing it at, like, maybe six foot. But he made it to the Eastern Conference Finals. It's not like his – like, he's brought a team to the Eastern Conference Finals before. Right. But uh, so much of the narrative around that is 
Ben Simmons forgot how to play basketball. Whose fault is that? That's his Ben Simmons' fault that he forgot how to play basketball. It's not it's not Trey Young's fault that this guy that gets paid millions of dollars and is six ten forgot how to make a layup, like or didn't even want to shoot a layup. Like All right, yeah. that's not why you but you see that's the thing. Why are you even in that predicament? Like people want to blame the stuff that happened, but it's like, why are you even in that predicament in the first place? Y'all are supposed to be the better team. Why right. is it even why did it even get down to that? It's terrible, bro. Low key Joel and B got a lot of scapegoats. He's he's had a lot of scapegoats. When you really think about it, people only remember the Ben Simmons thing. Mm-hmm. People blame Doc. People blame Harden. He's had a lot. We on you, Joel. We on you. We on, you're not escaping the off the glass. We on you, Joel. <laughs> yeah, th- this postseason was the last straw. I don't have no more excuses for him. Because when you like, like you said, you go back and you look at it. Like you can find things from each series. The one that probably stings the most for them and Sixers fans as a whole is the Jimmy Butler shot, which, like, that's just one of the wildest buzzer beaters. It might be the craziest buzzer beater in NBA history. Yeah. Um, so, but that one aside, you've been questionable in the second round every single year the last four years. Yeah. You know what's crazy, too? Complete like side note. I'm just now I'm because I'm looking at all the playoff series. It's really crazy to think that the best series could have been the Kings Warriors in the first round. Like that. No, that, that was like. i like it was so exciting every single game. Mm-hmm. Came down to the wire most of the games. Right. Even the game seven, it's like if it, it didn't come down down to the wire, but we still got to watch Steph put up fifty. We right, we watched a record breaking performance. Right, I, damn, that's crazy. Yeah, that series is that is like that's a series we're going to talk about in like twenty years. Like, man, if y'all kids could have seen that. Yeah, like, you had <laughs> to be there for that. You had to be there for that one. Yeah, that was crazy. Yeah. Look, like I <clears throat> going through all this and like making this. This team, I cannot wait until we get the hour, two hour long 2023 NBA final like co- compilation. And we just get to see all every single clips, every highlight, all the way through to whatever happens now going into the finals. Cause mm-hmm. we talked about it in our very first episode. Like this playoffs felt so wide open. And there's so much parity going into the league that even after the trade deadline, so much of that parity held. And like as high as I felt like the expectations were for this postseason, I think it exceeded it in a lot of ways. Um, Definitely. We had upset after upset after upset in the East. And in the West, we had – Tons of like we saw a tightly contested seven game series. We saw tightly contested sweeps. <laughs> I'm the closest sweep I've ever seen in my life. Like I genuine, thought we was in every single game. Genuinely, the only two series that were really like I don't want to say snooze fest. That's I ain't doing too much. But when you look at like obviously the sweep in the first round, Philly and the Nets, um, and then. The Nuggets and the Timberwolves was never really close um, outside because they got hurt. Suns yeah, like, that they, too. they never had a fair shake. Yeah, um, but even that, those first couple of games were excited. Man, Kawhi didn't yeah. get hurt. D book might not be on our all playoff teams. He might he not might make not. it to the second round. He might not. We have a whole different discussion. Yeah, so I, I, I think this playoffs has been so exciting. It's lived up to the hype. It's exceeded the hype. Um, and we winding it down. We're reaching that point where very soon, a couple of weeks, there's going to be no NBA basketball until at least summer league in July. And then Man. preseason starts in September. We got a ways to go. Yeah. Two teams left, man. The final stretch. Yeah. You going to lock into the W at all? I've been thinking about. Trying to get into WNBA Yo, a little bit more. I'm not gonna lie, like I, I don't know if I could lock into WNBA. Just, I don't really know. I don't know any teams. I don't know any players. But I've seen one girl. I don't. I forgot her name. She has like some like. I think she's like African, something like that. She is it Arike? Yes, 
She's Steve a Hooper. Hooping. Yo, I, yes. see, I just saw a couple clips and I was like, who is this? She be going crazy, bro. Like, she that's my new favorite WNBA player. Like that, bro. Like she is like that for real. Yeah, that's my favorite player. So yeah. whatever team she on, that's my team. We rock. She, she she plays for the uh the Dallas Wings. Ew, that sounds gross. My team was the LA Sparks. I don't even know why. Just, you not a uh, Connecticut man. Sun fan? No, ew. I'm straight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm straight. They made it. They went to the finals last year. Did they really? Yeah. Never mind. We rock it. That's my right. team. <laughs> Bandwagon. Look at the Lakers <laughs> fan. Bandwagon. <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, but but nah, she, that's my t- that's she's she's my favorite player. She put up 27 points a night. She bro, she's a bucket, bro. Yeah, she is an absolute bucket. It's it's a couple of super teams in the WNBA this year. Just, I, I just peaked, low yeah. key. The People aces bro, the aces roster is crazy. They have already had they won last year, right? They have Asia mm-hmm. Wilson, who's a bucket, Kelsey Plum is a bucket. Chelsea Gray, and then they went and got Candace Parker. Don't that's cheating. That this should be cheating. That's crazy. That's actually kind of. I'm looking at their roster right now. Their roster is loaded, and then the other one is the uh, the Liberty. The Liberty got Sabrina, and then they went out and got um, Brianna Stewart. Brianna, yeah, Brianna yeah. Stewart. Let me find out y'all making super teams over here. They, they, they are. They, they, they in the 2017 Warriors era right now. That's what they, they doing. are. They got Sabrina, John Quill Jones, and Brianna Stewart, and they looking to run it. Um, so, yeah, I'm going I'm to tap more into the, the WNBA this, the, in, during the NBA offseason because they said bro, it, they're hooping in there. It's still good basketball, man. Yeah, I'm about to say, it is high-quality basketball. It. You don't need to – I'm about to say, definitely don't sleep on them. Like, I'm – I just am not knowledgeable about the WA, but they definitely play great basketball. There's definitely good hoops over there. Yeah, so I, I think I'm going to lock into that some more, but. Heard it. We're going uh, to wrap things up tomorrow. Or not tomorrow. Thursday is the, the first game of the finals. It's going to be in Denver. They have not dropped a game at home all season or all postseason. Um, mm-hmm. So who you got game one? Denver. Come. They're off of too much rest. Miami just played. I got Denver. In the altitude, I got Denver, bro. I'm sorry. I, I wouldn't be surprised if game one was like a – we blowing them out. Just because – they, bro, they've been off for, what, 10 days? Yeah, that's – They've had nothing but rest. Miami's off of – Jokic probably went to Serbia and rode some horses. He's Literally. His <laughs> mind is reset. He's perfect. <laughs> exactly, bro. They're locked in over there, bro. I got uh, faith. What would you do if Miami for real came out and just like took the first two in Denver? <laughs> took the first two, not the first one, the first two, mm-hmm. bro. Spo is the greatest coach ever. Jimmy Butler. He, I think he may like is genuinely putting together a case for that. Like obviously he doesn't have the same rings as like somebody like Phil Jackson has, mm-hmm. but. He didn't coach the type of talent Phil Jackson did for at least not as long as Phil did. Had LeBron right. stayed in Miami for that whole time, they could have just like, you know, built something in Miami. It could be a whole different story because he's still already, like you said, building that best coach ever case. But Spo will be the greatest coach ever. Jimmy Butler. I don't even the discourse around Jimmy Butler. I like I wouldn't even. It, it doesn't make sense how unreal. Uh, the discourse around him would get, bro. Like, he would yeah. be one of the best playoff performers ever. Like, not our generation, ever. Like, right. forever, bro. I'm going to say, I'm going to say right here now, and, and the comment section can hold me to it. If the Heat, by some, by, I don't know what type of luck it would have to take, if they were able to win this series, the very next episode, I will be here in a Jimmy Butler jersey. Like, y'all got my work. <laughs> <laughs> the Heat win this got series. To, I, look, as soon as the buzzer goes off, I it'll get getting shipped to my house. <laughs> Man. That's, look, David versus Goliath, and he just slayed Goliath every single round. He could pull it out all. Best playoff run ever. You beat two one seeds, a two seed. 
you know, missing your 20 point per game score. Your AFC, you barely made the play. You barely made it out of the play in. Best playoff run ever. Somebody said, somebody said the, the Bulls were closer to beating this, the Heat than the Celtics were. <laughs> Low key. You know, I see, I see some play. It was like uh, DeMar DeRozan's daughter having to go to school that day is the craziest butterfly. Effect. It really is. It really <laughs> is. If she goes there, she screams a little bit. They miss some free throws. We could, Chicago could be might be in the NBA finals. You never know, bro. We could, be talking about, we could be talking about DeRozan, like how we talking about hey, Jimmy. Bro. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. But that's going to do it for another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. Um, as always, be sure to like, comment, subscribe to the channel if you're watching or listening on, on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Um, we appreciate you, first of all, for making it through the whole episode. So definitely be sure to go ahead and drop five stars on the podcast. Um, yeah, Thursday night, we're tipping it off for – for the Larry OB, that nice little trophy back there. So it's the best time of the year as always. So we appreciate you for listening, and we out. Peace. Yes, sir.